technical difficulties, but we are all set now. Um, thanks so much for joining us for our conversation today with artist Wendy Redstar. Um, in late October, we opened a new exhibition entitled True Likeness, and I was fortunate enough to be able to collaborate and co-curate this project with Tom Stanley. Tom is joining us here in the Zoom as well. Tom is a longtime friend and mentor, um, kind of a forever mentor, whether he wants to be or not. Um, he's a really amazing curator and his work has really influenced a lot of the work and interests um, of mine over the last few decades. So this exhibition process began about two years ago, um, but as things in the world shifted, the exhibition shifted in, in many ways as well. And so I wanted to invite Tom to just say a little bit about True Likeness and, and the exhibition before we dive in with Wendy. Okay, thank you. As Leah noted, uh, planning for this exhibition at Davidson's uh, Van Avery Smith Galleries began over two years ago. Originally, it was going to be an exhibition that focused on the work of self-taught artists. Uh, it then evolved into a portrait exhibition. However, as the po political climate became more divisive in this country, and as we expanded our ideas um, about what portraiture might be, uh, True Likeness became an exhibition about identity, diversity, and difference that is the landscape of this country. It is a landscape that speaks more to our similarities and it needs to be celebrate, celebrated. By coincidence, uh, the project was planned to open after the Republican convention in neighboring Charlotte and during the 2020 election, which seems to still be going on. Um, it features 18 artists as well as collected anonymous vernacular photographs Many uh, in the exhibition are critically recognized. Others are emerging in their practice. And still other artists uh, were never part of institutional art during their lifetime. The diversity in this exhibition exists as we typically think of diversity. People of color, ethnicity, immigrants, gender, sexual orientation. Many of the artists have use their practice to shine a light on systemic, systemic racism and others have worked in their practice uh, to affirm their own identities. And still others in true likeness have used portraiture in a style or approach that is oftentimes not recognized as art. Uh, the work has come together in, in the galleries where, where it is really having a conversation a conversation that we all must have. And it has been a unique pleasure to work on this project and uh, to learn more than I was able to bring to it myself. Leah? Thanks, Tom. So obviously Wendy is um, one of the 18 artists included in the exhibition and we feel really lucky that you were willing to participate and, and also to have this conversation today, even if it does have to be virtual. Um, so a quick note of thanks. This talk was co-sponsored with our friends in the history department here at Davidson College. So thanks very much to them. Um, and our exhibition and other programming that's coming up has been um, supported through the Herb Jackson and Laura Grosch Gallery Endowment and also the Davidson College Friends of the Arts. So we just wanted to add that thanks. Um, so our format today, I'm going to introduce Wendy. We'll turn it over to her to talk about her work sort of generally and then also to touch on the piece um, that is in our exhibition. And then we'll save some time for questions at the end. So if you are watching this via YouTube live, um, just put your questions in the chat. Elizabeth Harry, our gallery and collection coordinator is here as well. And she's moderating the chat and will um, ask those questions towards the end. There is a slight lag in YouTube. So we do advise that you get your questions in as early as you can. Um, so Wendy's um, large scale photograph in our exhibition, um, Asalika Feminist One, and the related series is sort of a contemporary update to the kind of stereotypical turn of the century portraits that we might be accustomed to seeing of indigenous women, um, particularly those by photographers and ethnologists like Edward Curtis or Richard Throssell, um, who both documented life on the Crow Reservation. Through this series and, and many of her other works, 
Red Star's work really counters what we might expect to see in portraiture, these sort of imposed biases from the photographer. Her work really confronts these sort of stereotypical, expected, romanticized depictions of indigenous women, and instead tries to capture a more honest, evolving identity of 21st century um, indigenous women, particularly Crow women and mothers. So Red Star is Crow and Irish descent and was born in Billings, Montana. She grew up in Pryor, Montana on the Crow Reservation, which is a rural community and sovereign nation. She earned her BFA in art from Montana State University and her MFA from UCLA. Her artwork has been exhibited at institutions internationally, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Newark Museum of Art, Portland Art Museum, the Hood Art Museum at Dartmouth, the St. Louis Art Museum, and the Minneapolis Institute of Art, among many others. She's also served as a visiting lecturer at institutions across the United States and abroad. She has received numerous awards and honors, including an Emerging Artist Grant from the Joan Mitchell Foundation, a Lewis Comfort Tiffany Award, and a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. And she is joining us from um, her home in Portland, Oregon. So thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hi, <laughs> I'm having um, some technical challenges here, <laughs> which nothing, nothing like a little bit of technical um, challenges to keep you on the edge of your seat. Uh, but I'm happy to be here. Thank you for the patience of everyone who is attending. I know there are a million other things you could be doing, but um, you're here. And I just wanna show some gratitude for that. I also wanna thank Leah, Tom and Elizabeth and the Davidson College Galleries for including Upsalaga Feminist number one in the exhibition. I'm truly honored and it looks like an amazing exhibition and I'm happy to be here uh, virtually. <laughs> and I'm also just grateful that institutions are figuring out ways to um, keep it going. Um, and creating these virtual spaces. I'm going to um, just show like a little snippet um, from my practice that focuses on intergenerational collaboration and sort of give you the origin story of that. I uh, started collaborating with my daughter, Beatrice Red Star Fletcher um, uh, at age seven, and then she retired herself at age 11. Uh, but within that collaboration, we created some amazing and powerful artwork together. Uh, we went on some amazing art adventures. And it all started with this exhibition that I had in 2014 at the Portland Art Museum. And there was a lot of talk at that time about cultural appropriation. And I was thinking of, especially regarding native imagery. And I was thinking about like, how has that specifically affected my community, the Absalaga community? And immediately I thought of Chief Medicine Crow, who is a Crow leader from the 1800s um, through the 1900s. And uh, there are two images of him, this image and this next image that pretty much ever since I left the reservation to attend college at Montana State University in Bozeman, which is about four hours away or three hours drive from the reservation, um, I ran into this image. Um, and then when I left there, I uh, attended UCLA and I also ran into um, his image. And then just later on in life, um, like this is through my travels to give uh, lectures when we used to do that before the pandemic. <laughs> this is at, actually at some random airport and this one of his images is on there. And then regarding um, my time at UCLA, I used to go to Whole Foods just to get honest tea because his image was on there. And um, I actually found it kind of comforting to run into him because oftentimes when I'm not on my reservation, I don't really get to be around my community. So in a way, sort of a surrogate figure <laughs> that I could glance over um, at and say, oh, there's, there's a part of home. But 
this opportunity and the discussion that was happening around 2014 um, made me kind of uh, look at those two images in a new way, maybe more, more of a critical lens. And I started thinking about, um, or asking myself like, well, actually what happened? How, how did this uh, photo uh, take place? Like, where was he? I don't even know where he was. And with that question, I, I started to do some research and, um, Oh, I just wanted to mention too, if you happen to Google his name, there are portraits and drawings uh, from those two images. And uh, one of his descendants, Joseph Medicine Crow, shows up too. That's who's with uh, Barack Obama there. But um, what I learned was that he was, um, it was actually a portrait that was taken in 1880. The photographer's name was Charles Milton Bell. And uh, he was the head photographer of the Bureau of Ethnology in Washington, DC. And that these were standard delegation photos um, that were um, typically taken of native delegations that came to do business in Washington, DC. And that they were really thought of as, um, I, I guess in that time period, it was sort of a record keeping thing, but it also, the trend and what was happening in anthropology and ethnology was the study of native people. Um, and so they were sort of treated as a type. So this Crow delegation, they, their images represented what all Crow people should look like. Or if a Lakota delegation came, um, they that would be what Lakota people should look like. And so it was sort of this collection. And often you'll see in these photos that they're um, taken at various angles too. And I, I very much think that has to do with uh, sort of the, the research that they were doing at the time. So not only was I surprised to learn all this information um, and also realized that there were other Crow chiefs, some of who I knew just from growing up on the reservation and a few that I had no idea about um, that, uh, that now when I look at his photo, I realized, and I think of it more as um, an activism, a type of activism on part of the Upsalaga community to maintain our culture in every aspect. Um, and so this particular trip that they took to Washington DC, which was actually the second trip for our community, the first one happened in 1873, was um, because the US government was trying to put a train through a large track of our hunting territory. Um, now, I think this is like such an incredible delegation to start with because this partic particular delegation has so much information, um, so much recorded in personal accounts from some of the men, some of the chiefs. And, and an another wonderful aspect of this um, delegation are these amazing drawings done by Medicine Crow himself. And when he returned after uh, being away for two months, he was asked if he would draw the trip from memory. And so this is a, um, from memory, uh, a drawing of the Capitol, various boats, three different types of trains. And then the other thing I started to um, think about was their, their uh, their clothing specifically. Um, and the clothing is familiar to me and that it's something that I grew up seeing some parts of these um, different pieces of, of attire that they're wearing being worn today. Um, but I never ever really asked like anything about it. Um, and what I learned was that they were, uh, what, what they're saying through their clothing is how they became a, a crow chief or a bajet chap, which the literal translation of that is a good man. And so there are four things that you had to do. Be the first in a battle to touch an enemy warrior, um, taking a, a weapon in hand-to-hand -hand combat from an enemy, stealing a horse from it within an enemy camp and leading a successful war party. And these different um, honors, you would get to wear something on your outfit that would state that. And all of these needed to be witnessed. Uh, so I started to outline these portraits um, and in that way, and outlining the portraits, I started to hone into details that I, my eye wasn't picking up until I started to um, 
kind of look at things in closer and slower detail. So this is actually Old Crow. He's one of the oldest chiefs. I think he is the oldest chief on this trip. And with that, then I started um, researching the other chiefs and writing down different things about them. For instance, he participated in Buffalo, Buffalo Bill's Wild West in 1884. Um, if I could find their crow name written in, in the crow language, I would include that. And then just to talk about um, sort of what the different aspects of their clothing, what they mean. So these little ermine on his war shirt meant that he uh, captured a weapon. Um, you can't see them, but he also has them on his leggings and that meant that he was able to steal a horse. And some of the various feathers worn on, on his shirt and in his hair represent leading a successful war party and so on. And then from there, I just um, continued to dig into each of these chiefs and, and I learned new things about each of them that I had not known. So this is Pretty Eagle. And when Pretty Eagle died, he was buried on our reservation um, in the back of a wagon box, which was considered an honorable way to bury a chief at that time. And then his remains were actually stolen from that site along with several other uh, crow remains and then sold. Um, as I mentioned, they were studying the bones of native people, indigenous people at that time. And so his remains ended up at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City for over 72 years. And then our tribe was actually able to get those remains back in the 90s. And there's a place on our reservation called Pretty Eagle Point, which has a bronze teepee structure. And so just living on the reservation, I would drive past that. <laughs> and I'd just say, oh, there's Pretty Eagle Point. But it wasn't until I did this research that I realized that's where we reburied his remains when they, and that they were stolen and um, we were able to get them back. So that was another incredible find. And this is Two Valley. He's not a chief that I knew about at all, but he's an important chief and he's a, a river crow. Um, there are two subsections of the Upsalaga tribe and there's the mountain crow and the river crow. And so even in his dress, he looks quite different. He's not wearing the, pompadour hairstyle. He's not wearing the war shirt, but he's wearing this really beautiful otter fur trimmed uh, floral beaded jacket, um, which is something that I had not recognized. I've never seen anything like this today that any Upsalaga people are wearing. And um, at the Portland Art Museum, they have a collection of native objects. They have a native gallery and they happen to have a similar floral style jacket. And so just to see this and see sort of the glory of the color really hit me that if only I could see those photos in color and just see how the vibrancy, um, how amazing that would be. And so I included this jacket in, in the exhibition and you can see Two Belly standing back here with, uh, with the jacket. Um, this is Plenty Coup. He was our last official chief and he died in the 30s. And um, he, when they were in Washington, since they were there for two months, they ended up taking them on sort of um, various trips for entertainment. And one of the trips they took them on was a trip to Mount Vernon, which is Washington's estate. And he was so struck by that experience. Um, there's actually quotes of him sort of just kind of being in awe of, well, Washington must have been such a great leader that they would uh, build this estate and keep this estate for him. And so that little seed sort of stuck in his head. And then fast forward to uh, 2012, 2013, I actually moved back to my reservation and I ran Chief Plenty Coup State Park. And Chief Plenty Coup State Park is on the Crow Reservation and it uh, has Chief Plenty Coup's log cabin. There's an apple orchard. There's his grave and his wife's grave and his adopted daughter's grave. And there's also a visitor center and sort of some walking trails. And it was through this project that I learned that, that um, he was so inspired by Mount Vernon that he wanted to create a miniature Mount Vernon on our reservation. 
And so before he died, he gifted his allotment to the state of Montana to create this park. And the park was a way for uh, non Crow people to come and visit, visit our reservation and visit his estate and learn about Crow culture. So that was another amazing connection. And then I had been followed around all those years, haunted by those two images in a good way. And <laughs> looking, I realized there were multiple images of Medicine Crow and somehow those two became sort of the popular ones that kept getting recycled. So here's another image of Medicine Crow. You'll notice that um, if you look sort of on the ground, I have um, his hair extensions are circled. So Crow men love to wear hair extensions. Hair, long hair equals power. And most of the men on this trip were wearing hair extensions. You'll notice that um, he's actually wearing a hair bows and this one is broken. And I wanted to talk a little bit more about the origin story of the drawings. There was a clerk, government clerk working on the reservation named Charles H. Barstow. And so when crows would come in to do business, if they were waiting for to meet with somebody, Charles uh, would give them some paper and ask them to draw their experiences. So he's the one who uh, was responsible for um, getting Medicine Crow to draw the trip. And from there, another entertainment trip they went on was to see one of the first circuses in the US. And so here, here are some drawings of um, different circus animals that he saw. And a lot of these animals, of course, do not um, uh, reside in Montana or the territory of Montana. And so he had to come up with some of the names. So the writing is all Charles Barstow's writing, but for instance, the um, Peacock is wonder tale comes from above. You got a long nose bowl, which is an elephant. Catfish. And um, an elk with a big back on him. So I, I've really kind of got a kick out of this thinking about him being home with uh, all the different tribal members and <laughs> trying to describe like, these crazy animals that are using animals within our territory to be like, well, sort of like an elk with a really big back. And um, I became uh, obsessed. I get obsessed a lot with things. And so I became obsessed with these drawings and I wanted to figure out, you know, in a, in a way, like how to make them more real for me or more tangible. I didn't just want them to exist in this form. And there was a, an advertisement on social media where you could turn in a children's drawing to a company and they would uh, make a soft toy out of it. So I, I got this wild hair idea and uh, sent in the, the camel and this is what I got back. And then from there, I just I kind of decided to keep going with it. Um, so this is a, a big snake with legs. There is the lion. And it, this was a lot of fun because I didn't really know what I was gonna come back with, what, they, what sort of editing choices they were going to um, choose or um, uh, edit out. This is a dog and man or man dog monkey. And this is a great sort of illustration of <laughs> him sort of forgetting. Um, and giving the zebra spots instead of stripes. So um, at that time, I was uh, I had a, I was had a full time job, and I was also um, trying to complete this exhibition and using all my spare moments to do that and raising my daughter. And at, a particular time where I was trying to get something done, I had a bunch of Xerox copies of these and she wanted to uh, play. And so I just handed her a stack of them um, and said she could do whatever she wanted and went back to my work. And then she came back with this drawing. And then it, it clicked for me. I realized, you know, I needed one more piece and I wasn't quite sure what that was going to be. And this drawing, I thought it was a perfect example really of 
why I'm making my work. It's for the next generation. And what better way than to include her voice and her ownership of that history. And so I asked her if she would like to uh, participate and she said, yes. So set her up with a little studio and she produced, I think over 20 drawings. And on the way over to the exhibition, she asked if she could um, speak about her work. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's kind of what artists do, right? <laughs> we speak about our work. And so I told her, of course, and she wanted to also talk about the animals. Um, and she's seven at the time. And she just has this gift of public speaking that I had not realized until we had this experience. Um, and not only that, I also realized that I was compartmentalizing myself of my, you know, adulthood, my parenting and my art career and all of this and realized that, no, I don't have to do that. There's actually something here and um, we, can, we can investigate and try, try to uh, collaborate together. And so we sort of started with the show. Um, this is her giving a tour to her classmates. So she did the whole tour. And then from there, um, anytime I would get an opportunity, I would talk to her about it and ask if she would want to participate. And then from there, um, we started our collaboration. So this is, uh, so that show happened in 2014. And so this is in 2016. And again, I was in a show um, at the Portland Art Museum called the Contemporary Native Photographers and the Edward Curtis Legacy. And we decided to create Upsalaga Feminist. And so this is our collaborative work. Um, Edward Curtis came to the Crow Reservation in the early 1900s and I was given access to all of his work that he had done on my community, including writings. And um, he also did some uh, field recordings of a lot of men singing that were actually uh, men who were from where I grew up. And one of the things that really stuck out to me while looking at um, the portfolio of the Upsalaga was um, sort of a lack of women, uh, a real focus on all the chiefs and uh, uh, the battle of Little Bighorn was huge back then. And uh, so a lot of the scouts who participated in that were selected and just a few women. And um, we're a matrilineal society where we have a clan system and you follow your mom's clan. And so that's something that I wanted to create, um, a portrait about our, our matrilineal aspect of Upsalaga culture. And then the other thing, which I always yearn when I'm looking at these historical photos is color. So really wanted to show <laughs> the vibrancy of, um, of our culture. And so we, in this particular series, there are four portraits. Here's Upsalaga Feminist, number one. Now I just want to like break because I know we had technical difficulties. So how are we on time? I think we're fine to keep hearing from you. Um, I don't know if Tom wants to jump in with a question or not, but if you have some more things to say about the work, we're happy to. Yeah. Oh, oh is Tom muted? I have a question before we leave it if you don't mind, because it fascinated sure. me. Uh, the portraits of the delegation were taken from a front view and a side view. And in like fashion, the drawings were all labeled as if they were scientific. Uh, doc Is there, was there reasoning behind both of this? Was it partly to document, not as in a humanistic way, but as, as specimens? Oh, totally. I think that was sort of, um, sort of the fascination at the time. Also, um, I think there was a, also a collecting of native objects, material culture and imagery. And so I think that really kind of played into sort of the, the labeling and maybe the forethought of um, Charles Barstow um, to, hey, if I can collect, you know, um, these drawings, because a lot of the drawings depicted um, battles and things like that. So I think definitely that was part of Charles Barstow's 
thinking in that as well? It was a great question. I just wanted to add to that um, or hear a little bit more about um, I, ju I just love the way that your own sort of dissection of those images was a way of understanding your own culture and learning new things that, um, you know, I, I, yeah, just sort of taking that idea for granted that we, we all know everything about our own culture, which is completely false, right? We learn from um, images, which is often can be stereotypical or we ignore things in our own environment. So I, I love sort of the, the idea of dissecting them um, and thinking about them as specimens in a way, but for, for a better purpose for your own knowledge and, and then to share that with other people, so. Yeah, thank you. I um, I think that really struck me that the Medicine Crow and the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation Exhibition traveled for two years and it ended in Bellings, Montana, which is just um, like a 40, 45 minute drive from the reservation boundary. And so a lot of tribal members were able to attend and they would come up to me and say, I didn't know any of this stuff. And in that moment, I realized like, Wow, including my own, you know, the older generations as well. Um, and it's something where me and the little girl, as a little girl, kind of like my daughter here, we're both in our traditional elk tooth dresses. I grew up wearing that since I would pretty much came out of the birth canal <laughs> in an elk tooth dress. And I never, ever, until I started doing my artwork, asked um, about the elk tooth dress. It was just the normal thing that we wore during cultural events. Um, and so um, to me, when I hear other tribal members also say that they, they didn't know this stuff um, is another reason why it's, I feel so important for me to, you know, keep moving forward and keep doing the investigation uh, or research that I'm, that I'm doing. Okay. Tom, did you have other questions or do we want to hear more about other images? Well, it depends how far we want to go. <laughs> Feel free. I did, I actually did want to ask more about um, your collaborations with Beatrice because I didn't realize that she was in retirement. <laughs> um, so I'd love to hear about sort of that because I, I, you know, loved the, the idea of, you know, including her and thinking about future generation and how empowering um, that would would be. But I'm, I'm curious about her um, retirement. <laughs> yes. Well, I'll, I'll move forward, but I just, I'll tell a little bit more about Absalaga Feminist. So it was created in um, a house that I rented in the living room, which was my studio. So that's actually our Ikea couch there. And we used a self timer. And uh, that day I was also having technical difficulties. So the remote <laughs> thing wasn't working. So it's actually quite comical. Um, I would have to push the self timer and then run and jump on the couch and, try to cover myself with a shawl and <laughs> had no idea what B was doing. Um, and uh, the timer would go off. So there's a lot of like, when I see these images, I'm kind of thinking of the franticness of uh, trying to get in the shot. And then from there, a B and I um, ourselves would, uh, went through and selected the images, but we also had a, a pretty good laugh with some of the facial expressions. And then the other important uh, aspect is again, the elk tooth dress. It's our traditional crow dress and the um, white uh, kind of polka dot looking things you're seeing that are um, covering the dress are actually represent the two eye teeth of an elk. And so they also represent um, sort of the status of the, the, the women or the family, the hunting abilities because uh, it would take a, a lot of hunting to get, um, typically some dresses have 500 teeth. And um, they also represent um, maybe the trading abilities. And then uh, around the turn of the century, I think elk were almost extinct. Native people were more confined to the reservation and couldn't hunt like they used to. So uh, women and men started to carve the teeth and if you ever see, happen to see one of these dresses in a museum, you might read on the card that the, uh, that the description of the materials 
our wool and beads and wood or um, what else, bone. And that indicates that the teeth were carved out of wood or bone. And now most of the teeth, um, I'd say almost 95% of the teeth are made out of um, resin, but they still hold that uh, symbolism. And then, um, yeah, the beadwork. There are so many different hands that went into the making of my outfit um, and my daughter's outfit. And so, um, you know, some of the beadwork is, is um, beaded by my Irish mother, <laughs> but directed by my Crow grandmother, who was known, especially the beadwork that my daughter's wearing, was uh, very famous for her rose drawings and designs. And so she drew all the roses and um, the leaves and vines and then um, directed my mom on how to bead. So I really look at that piece of beadwork that my daughter was wearing that was originally for me and then uh, now she owns it really uh, sort of lovingly. Another idea of natural, uh, sort of natural lineal descent there, just, just even through the handiwork of, of the beading. Um, you'll notice this doll, the dolls that my daughter are holding are dolls that my grandma gave me when I was a, a little tiny kid. And then you'll see that doll that's on the back of the couch there. And there's a, a wonderful story there where I was uh, occasionally go on eBay and I'm holding her up here in the screen. And um, I type in crow beadwork and this doll popped up and immediately I knew that my grandma had beaded this or made this. And so I just bought it. <laughs> and then I find, I read the detail and it said, it, you know, made by Amy, Amy Red Star in the eighties. And my grandma um, had passed a few years uh, before I made this work. And when the doll came to me, um, it has her handwriting down here. And um, to me, it was like, it really made me feel like how amazing is art, right? That, you know, my grandma's passed away and she made this doll and it, she sold it and it, it was on the East Coast for decades. And then randomly I get on eBay and I find it and it's back, it's back in my hands. And so I just was like really feeling like how important the making of art is and uh, connecting culturally with art. And so um, we brought this, when I got it, my uh, daughter has ownership of it now, but yeah, it's included in this artwork. Again, another kind of interesting matrilineal connection as well. But yeah, I'll, I'll cruise through just some of our collaborative because I know you asked about that um, work. So this is be given a tour <laughs> again um, to her class. And then we had um, our first artist residency, I believe in like 2017 or maybe towards the end of uh, the beginning of 2018 at the Denver Art Museum. And for this, she specifically wanted to make a tour just for children. She even had an age range. And so we set her up with her own badge. And um, then she was set loose in the museum to select artworks for her um, 30 minute tours. She gave three of them. And then she became so interested in, in this idea of a tour guide that she made a, a drawing of what her outfit should look like. So I sewed up a little outfit there for her. And here she is in action. And this was an amazing experience because I've seen, you know, museum tours led um, by docents for children, but I've never seen a child lead a tour and I've never seen children not say a peep, <laughs> just totally staring and like following her like, uh, like the Pied Piper or something. It was incredible. <laughs> like, the level of engagement was like on a 10. Um, and then from there, we just sort of started to, I'm gonna cruise through these. Um, we just started to uh, really um, find our groove. So we were invited to the Tang Teaching Museum and this is a body of work called the Four Seasons, which I made in graduate school in 2006. And they were inspired by a trip to the Natural History Museum where um, I, I don't know what happened, but I had a sort of a critical lens that I um, took with me um, 
in that experience of going to that natural history museum because I was on a mission to find crow objects. And I did, but before I got to the crow objects, I walked through this crazy dinosaur exhibit. And I realized once I got to the native galleries that the museums had sort of set us up to think everything in that institution was extinct. And I did see crow moccasins. And so this is um, sort of utilizing the diorama as, as sort of my subversive way or tool to show you know, how institutions um, show native uh, material culture and native bodies. And so for this particular um, collaboration between B and I, I, I treated it sort of a little bit like an, um, an, an apprentice or intern and um, gave her a walkthrough of how to recreate a season. And so we did all the shopping for the animals and the backdrop and this is her towards the end of the day. And then, um, then for this, I actually let her photograph museum goers in the diorama. So I, I give her the sort of, she has the agency now. She's on the other end. And then um, this is her retirement. <laughs> so uh, she retired at 11 and we, um, she gave an, a, a tour at the uh, Pulitzer in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So here, here she is uh, talking about Ruth Asawa's work. And she's 13 now. She's actually managing my career now. So <laughs> that's what she's doing. Um, but yeah, I'll just, I'll just end, end on that note. So cool. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah, I think there, I had some questions. I think there's a question in the chat to, um, do you wanna address that one first maybe, Elizabeth? Yeah, so Richard wants to know, what are the sources of the backdrop or wall hanging um, and the floor covering in um, Opsilica Feminist? Yeah, that's a great, question um and you know my everything that I produce is just sort of um kind of pretty low budget <laughs> and it's um it's sort of something that I just stuck with ever since graduate school that I actually aesthetically really like um and so they're just Pendleton blankets that I had um pinned up to the wall behind us and then placed on the ground and then I digitally manipulated them after um we shot the, the images. And, you know, really the effect I was going for is that B and I would be in super sharp focus and sort of the, the focus. And so one of the uh, background and foreground to amplify that. I've got another question um, from the audience. Marin wants to know, uh, well, she comments, it was wonderful to hear how you collaborate with your daughter how does your role as a mother impact your work even when you're not collaborating with your daughter? Well, I think, you know, you always hear all the cliche things about parenthood and um, in my case, <laughs> they have really uh, sort of given me the ultimate sense of purpose. Um, and it's pretty much everything it is for my daughter. <laughs> and even the new work I'm doing is really about genealogy and kinship and just like a, a identity a legacy for her um, that she'll have, whether or not she's directly um, included in it or not. Um, so yeah, I'd say she influences me 24-7. Uh, <laughs> Tom, did you have some questions too? Um, well, I, it's a pretty general question. I. I find, you know, having a chance to listen to you and see your work from your perspective, it really creates a very accessible understanding of, I think, what you're trying to do. And especially in, a, in, in our world with so much chatter going on and people really have no idea. Do you think art has that potential to be uh, a messenger for, um, for the conversations that we do need to have? I do. I think for me, I, um, as a, 
a kid, I had a really hard time learning. Part of that was that I was dyslexic. And so I always felt um, like um, behind in, in my messaging, I guess, or not adequate. Um, and it wasn't until like probably my sophomore year when I switched to sculpture that I realized that I speak the loudest and the most clear, uh, clearest through um, my visual work. And it's, um, and so that's sort of then the, the medium to amplify my thoughts and my voice. So it works for me. And I do, and I do think that I've seen other artists and visual artists, we, we tend to, to do that. So I do think it is important um, for me. And it's really wonderful, Tom, to hear that <laughs> from you. Because in a way, I feel like um, that is success for me and yeah um, if it, See, if, I, it can I think I recall you yeah. visually then I all your exhibition from St. Louis now that I think about it these things come back to me yes um, not the Pulitzer you know thank you yeah. Wendy we have some more questions from the audience um someone asks uh does your Irish ancestry ever enter your work or does it coexist with Crow you know my mom um She's super proud. Her name is Marie Margaret Malone and her nickname is Molly. So <laughs> obviously, like, that's why my family is uh, so proud of their uh, Irish heritage. Um, my mom actually came to the Crow Reservation uh, as a nurse and she worked as a public health nurse. And that's how she met my father. But before that, she was based in Korea through the army as a nurse and she adopted my sister. And um, when she came back to the United States, she decided she didn't wanna, she wanted to work on an Indian reservation. Um, so I think she's always just been like uh, sort of an adventurer and very comfortable with um, being sort of a, a minority in a minority, if that makes sense. like. <laughs> being um, in Korea and being the only white person or being on the reservation surrounded in the quilt culture. Um, she's just had that ability to be sort of um, let herself be not the, the my, uh, not the minority or majority. There we go. <laughs> um, and so the amazing thing about my mom is that she was the one who really wanted me to be in the culture. So that beadwork that she um, did and uh, worked with my grandmother, um, she helped me participate in cultural things. And I think that duality is interesting because it kind of plays into my work. My father, him being uh, living his whole life on the reservation, except for when he was in the Marines, um, he, d he thought of it as normal, you know? So for her to say, this is actually quite extraordinary and um, so important. Uh, so she knew like, this is something that my kid needs to be part of. So I, I, credit, I credit her with that. And I guess in, to answer the question, it, it, I guess it, we were so proud of the Irish ancestry, but just growing up on the reservation and her sort of, um, knowing from being an outsider how important the culture and um, like participating in the culture is, I, I credit her for, for that and the reasons why I'm so invested. Thank you. I've got another question from Leanne who says, thank you for sharing your incredible work. I'm so grateful to have the chance to hear this talk today. I'm struck by the levels of translation at play in your work, past to present, image to text, and also your use of written English. How do you understand translation in your artistic practice? Mm. Well, thank you. That's, uh, I, I love getting feedback. <laughs> it's so nice to hear that. Um, wow, I'm just thinking that uh, when it hits me, like something fascinating like that, a translation between one thing to the next hits me, um, I, want to sh I want to show that somehow so I think I'm having a, a little bit of epiphany in the work itself and want the audience to see that that um, epiphany um, 
So I think that's why sort of these different translations happen. I'm also really interested in like, it always starts with a curiosity for me and um, trying to figure out the best medium, the best vehicle that will help translate that one thing from like a text or from a photo into another thing that will really kind of um, illuminate what it is that sparked my interest. Could you actually expand a little bit on that, especially for the art students that might be joining us? Um, I'm just thinking about how um, your work, you work sort of fluidly through lots of different media. The work is obviously heavily researched based, but then sometimes it's photography, sometimes it's sculpture. Your degrees are actually in sculpture, correct? Yeah. yeah. So could you talk about that, those kinds of choices and how, um, you know, is it more of a gut feeling or how do you make those decisions? Uh, what, which media would be the right one for a work of art? Um, well, I'll just maybe give you a little background history. So um, at Montana State University in Bozeman, their focus really was on sort of um, the craft, the craft of every medium and really honing in the craft. And I had to, I had to pick a discipline and sculpture to me was like the one that you could get away with the most. You could still do painting, or you could, um, you could, uh, you can include all these other mediums into it. So I, I really thought I was getting away with something. So I think in that way, um, that you know, that was sort of the reasoning behind that. Um, and then when I went to UCLA, it was really a school of thought and conceptuality, and um, I just will never forget that, uh, I think it was a sculpture tech. Um, he's, he said, oh, if we can't make it here, somebody in Los Angeles can do it. <laughs> I was like, what? I've never, like that kind of blew me away. I mean, I still think money would have probably been an object of why I couldn't make that <laughs> option happen. But um, I just sort of kind of love that. So I think having the combination of those two um, schools of thought really kind of freed me from sort of uh, limitation and a medium choice. Um, but uh, so for, for me, really, I, I'm sort of, it really is about the concept first and then figuring out like, oh, wouldn't that be interesting to translate it into this medium? Um, so that, that's typically how it works. So it's idea first and then figuring out the, the vehicle. Thank you for confirming those things for students that like it's about the concept often. <laughs> um, I don't know if there are other questions, Tom, if you had other questions, I know we're around our, our time. I feel like um, a million, <laughs> but won't ask them all. <laughs> Tom, are you good? I'm good, thank you. I, this has been great. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. I'm glad that technology <laughs> I'll do. Eventually it always works. <laughs> yes, yes. Wendy, since you kind of started um, with this, just saying that you were grateful for institutions to be able to still do things in the pandemic, I, I feel like we never even asked you, how are you and <laughs> how have things been? And has, uh, especially knowing that the pandemic is sort of disproportionately impacting Black and Indigenous folks, I was curious if there was um, you know, if it had impacted your work, if you thought that it that it might um, kind of show up in in your work, and also, um, you know, what what kind of things uh, are you do you need as an artist? Mm. Well, thank you. I'm I'm doing good, and my family's doing good. Um, I, when it you know the shutdown started happening. Um, I think it was very devastating. <laughs> um, so especially as an artist and I'm, you know, self-employed and things were getting sort of canceled left and right or postponed. Um, so it was sort of really destabilizing. Um, and, but then I think a lot of artists and, and, and people in general, I think have sort of realized that maybe the pace at which they were going before the pandemic um, was a little bit 
you know, too, too fast, um, maybe even to some a little bit toxic and um, that it, that this is given sort of everybody a chance to kind of reevaluate the ways in which they want to move forward. Um, and so for that, I think it's been really good. I think it's caused a lot more communication in some ways. So um, working with institutions, <laughs> meeting people in these sort of virtual formats um, has been great. And then there's just, to me, there's been a lot of beautiful moments of people just coming through, you know, like they, uh, something got canceled and then they're like, no, we're gonna make this happen. And um, so there's been that. So I've really appreciated that. But regarding like the pandemic and indigenous communities, the Crow community is going through a terrible time through the pandemic right now. And it's really hard for people to social distance when some families, there's three or four families living in a household and one family is living in each room. So how do you social distance in a situation like that? And then the Indian Health Service, the Crow Hospital isn't equipped to do anything um, that is beyond sort of kind of basic, basic uh, checkups and things like that. So I think it's going to be hard. I think it's going to be hard for rural and uh, indigenous communities through through this time. And I'm just happy to hear a little glimmer of hope with uh, maybe a vaccine that works. And then of course uh, Biden you know, and Harris. I'm like I'm relieved. I'm totally relieved by that too. So I'm just ready to start moving forward and um, and. Uh, you know, finding some solutions and um, fixing things. Well, thank you. And I think um, as an artist, I, I feel like you are sort of part of the solutions in a lot of way, at least for me and for our hearts and for sort of our culture. And so those have been the things that have really helped me through. I feel like I've put a lot of, um, a lot of pressure in, in many ways on artists, but so thank you for what you do. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Well, we um, look forward to chatting with you again soon. And I hope that at some point you might be able to actually come to our campus. Um, yeah, <laughs> me too. Yes. <laughs> For folks in YouTube Live, the exhibition with Wendy's work is on view until February 21st. And if you are part of the campus community, you can come in whenever. If you are part of the public, we have some public days coming up um, in December and January. So we hope that we'll see you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks so much. Bye, everybody.